we probably didn't write it because we don't do those events. We mostly, most of our translation is uh, written or is just on the ground talking to people. And yeah, those events where it's just like, where people are just talking, that's, and there can't be like dialogue from others. Um, that, yeah, that's more likely to happen where there, where people are speaking too fast and too much and too much. Um, I think so. And I think you can kind of tell, uh, how collective minded someone is based on how they react in an interpretation situation because they, um, and also that you can see how monolingual they are. Um, because, uh, I think those who are more collectivistic, um, they know it's a lot of work for others. They know that they're taking up a lot of space, you know, that space that time does get kind of lost or taken up when there's interpretation. So people have to be kind of like to the point, spare the flowery language if possible. Um, if you want to share the, the floor with other people. And that's kind of one reason why I am unapologetically curt a lot of times. Or like I don't employ flowery language because I think I kind of get into that habit sometimes when because more often probably more often than the average person I'm like in a translation situation or interpretation situation and other people got to speak up and other people are, are are interpreting and translating and but uh one one of the reasons why I think that also makes it hard for the interpreter or the translator and Matt I don't know if you come across this too um but I think that when you're multi bilingual or multilingual um and if you, you you might have like this work ethic or this sense of integrity that you you have the power to lie um, if you don't get the translation correct and like you want to preserve what someone really meant. And I think in the process of interpreting, uh, you you realize how much like in a, in the same language we communicate without really understanding what someone means. There's like a lot of stuff that we it's okay. We don't need to really know what that means. We sometimes we don't even think about it, but in the process of translating, it's harder to resist that type of behavior because you're you're responsible for not lying and trying to communicate what someone's saying. So then you got to de- delve deeper and be like, okay, what do you mean by that? Because that can mean different things. Um, and yeah, that's one of the I guess one of the weird. Uh, inconveniences or, or challenges of translation, and I and I don't know how to. I don't know how to. That, maybe that's one reason why I stay away from certain types of translation too, because I don't like living with that feeling, and it gets all weird. If it's if it's like a presentation thing, it just so it's like impossible or awkward to resolve that issue. Um, but if it's in person, everyone's in person. It's easier to to resolve that. I don't know if I'm rambling, but check. Yeah, no, this is all, it's all good. It's all good information. I think it's good for people to to kind of hear the, the translator, the interpreter's perspective on these things. Um, Because I think a lot of times we just don't think about it. It's like, oh, well, you know, we hired an interpreter. We, we did our job. We did our bit. Um, Don't really think about too much past that. Um, You know, one of the things that when when I was reading it, that I was, thinking and you, you kind of hit on a little bit but um the fundraising specifically for interpretation translation services um and you know i was thinking that it would be nice if it was not something that necessarily every organization every movement group was you know just doing individually, which, you know, you should do that. You know, I think they should probably, we should probably all be doing that as well. But, you know, if we had, uh, you know, foundations or if we had some funders or some group that, you know, so if you had a collective of translators there in Chicago, say, you know, it's like, okay, here's, you know, $50,000 for your group. And then to pay you to provide translation services for whoever needs it. Right. Um, because, you know, that would, if we're really interested in access, you know, a lot of times I would think that 
uh, the the places where these services are most needed are not necessarily the the groups and the places they're going to be able to pay uh, for them. And we, you know, we still want that to be able to happen. So um, personally, I would like to see that kind of thing where, you know, some of the, our foundations that might have a little more money, like earmark some of it for specifically for language justice stuff, um, you know, kind of on the front end rather than uh, trying to get, just trying to get everybody to work it into their, their fundraising efforts. That's like, a, I think that point is interesting to me because one of the things I noticed, like one big difference between Japan and the U.S. is that social movement groups in Japan, uh, there's not this whole uh, nonprofit industrial complex there. There are very few nonprofit organizations. Social movement groups typically are very, very unfunded and just run off of dues. And... Um, even labor unions at the kind of local level, local, the bottom level, the grassroots level of labor movement, almost nobody's getting a salary from the union. It's like very, very, the whole movement culture about money is very different. But, you know, they would, the groups I knew, if they were dealing with, if language justice was relevant to what they were doing, they budgeted for it. And this is not because they had a lot of money. You know, it wasn't it's just kind of, it's an interesting, it was kind of a political decision on their part, I think. And I think that's something Chris and Armando's thing that I kind of like. It's like, you're kind of putting it out there. It's like, if you're going to be serious about this, you're going to have to deal with the fact that it is an expense. It's real. It's like, you know, I don't know. It's like, you have to really, you have to really think about that and whether you want to go, whether you want to deal with it. The other issue that, comes up to me. It came up when we were writing our book, uh, Cooperatives at Work, we interviewed uh, this guy, Miguel Yasuyuki Hirota, who's, who writes on alternative currencies and is actually the director of an organization that deals with alternative currencies in Spain. And Miguel is like multilingual, very active in the cooperative world. Um, he's really critical of the European cooperative movement in particular, but also the U.S. and around, it's like in Europe, if they figure if they translate into Spanish and French or English, you know, their job is done. <laughs> they completely ignore uh, non-European, non-Western languages, essentially. So South, South Asia, like they have zero capacity for it, and they put very little into translation and interpreting for uh, la languages outside of just the sort of European set. Um, so that's a big issue, the whole North-South issue. It's a kind of North-South issue, except that Spanish also bridges that. But that's something I saw that in, in your uh, piece, Chris, you guys mentioned the um, also the question of indigenous languages, right? So I know that among activists in Mexico, that's a big deal. Like Language justice means taking into account um, indigenous languages as well and, and kind of foregrounding them. So that's another, that, that's talk about, you know, making it even more challenging, Josh, <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. to, you know, think about having a, access to a whole series of interpreters. But ultimately I think that's a kind of, yeah, that's what language justice would look like. Yeah. I mean, it, it, this, uh, Again, you know, with all the, you know, the different languages and I, you know, I live on, um, you know, I live in rural Montana. Um, if it, it, language justice around here tends to mean um, trying to save the the native languages, uh, you know, uh, Salish and Kootenai um, languages here. Uh, but, you know, we don't, in general, you know, for our groups, it's like every everybody here everybody here speaks english so it's not that big of a deal um you know for us locally but you know thinking about other areas especially urban areas and then you know um there's like there's yeah there might be a, a lot of different languages and that definitely adds to it and again which makes me think like i i really like the fact that chris that you guys started with recommendations for people doing translating um you know, kind of starting there. Cause that, you know, it's like, okay. So um, like even in Missoula, not far from me again, another, 
you know, it's in Montana. We're not exactly known as the most cosmopolitan place in the world, but, you know, that we have a lot of Spanish speaking people in that town. We have a whole Hmong population, um, you know, most of whom are, you know, speak English, but, you know, nonetheless, we, and we've got uh, quite a few African immigrants at this point. Um, and so, you know, it makes me think like there's must be some scope for collective of people who are interested in facilitating this kind of communication between different people, um, you know, to get together. Um, yeah, that there, you know, that there needs to be some organizing among translators who speak different languages or people doing this kind of stuff, right? Um, because, because, yeah, because it does get to be a huge just uh, logistics issue, right? If you do, you know, it's like, okay, we want to make sure we're including everybody, so we've got to present this in Spanish and English and French and Waddle and, <laughs> right? It could be a little bit complex. Um, but definitely deciding first that we want to at least engage in this <laughs> in a serious way is the first step, which I think most of us, like a lot of us, we haven't even, don't even think about it. Um, mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah. I like that rec that idea that you had Josh about um, getting, I, you said like some sort of like fund that bestows translation funds to other groups. Um mm -hmm. Armando and I, we didn't we didn't talk exactly about we didn't talk in, in too too much depth about the idea of groups fundraising, um, but one one I and and that's I think that's for some groups I think that's the case that they don't they might not really have the capacity to really fundraise um, though uh, there is one organization that I'm aware of historically that uh, part of joining the org was you had to fundraise. That was like part and parcel of joining the org, um, but I think that like in Chicago, in Chicago, I've seen some incredible fundraising, and I'm surprised at times the amount of money that people can raise um, from not even being, not even having a, a an organized fundraising system, um, and I think that um, I think there's so much potential. And there's probably one one idea that comes to mind though about this idea of fundraising is maybe maybe groups can just set aside some maybe some groups can just set aside some of some funds or contribute offers list as part of like fundraising. Um, maybe it's not something that they you know to put too too much labor and set and set a, uh, maybe it's not something they set aside too much time to do, but it's one way that they're uh, leaning into uh, developing a better like fundraising practice. Um, and maybe it is uh, a different group or, or groups outside of one's group that kind of bottom lines fundraising and pulls together resources. Um, I don't know, but I think there's uh, so much potential. I, I, and it doesn't have to be fundraising just for translation either. I, almost all groups that I that I see they need they 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 need a fundraise, but they're not doing it, and they could go toward other things mm -hmm. too. It might solve many of their other problems if they lean into it. Mm -hmm.